Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by our friends at Manscaped. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that won't nick or snag your nuts. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have sex coach and former adult film school contestant. I don't know. You weren't really a contestant. More like a guest, Nicole Emma. Nicole, how are you? Hi. (laughs) Thanks for having me. You know, it's such a trip to have you here. Um, We were talking a little bit about this before the podcast, but I've talked about adult film school so much on this show because it was like a really big job, you know, hosting the show for Playboy TV. And um, it was a wonderful kind of experiment in, you know, how men think they can easily perform in front of the camera and like the realities of that. Right. So just to fill those of you in on like who haven't watched the show or haven't heard me talk about it, Adult Film School was a show for Playboy TV where we took amateur couples, people who were like, you know, sex positive open couples, but had never actually had sex on camera for real. And we were making a professional sex tape for them. So that was the premise. They wanted to have a professional sex tape made. They called me and I came in and I directed this fabulous sex tape and everything was rainbows and unicorns and perfect and nothing ever went wrong. And at the end they had this gorgeous stylized um, sex tape. It wasn't like that at all. <laughs> and, and Nicole is here to, 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 as a testament to that. It was, so before I like drag the show through the dirt, which I don't want to do actually, um, it was a wonderful experience for me. I'm so grateful that I had it. I'm so grateful to Playboy TV for having me host the show. It was so much fun. I learned so much, but you know, it was also like a really difficult premise taking people who'd never had sex in front of a camera camera before and giving them like one day to like do it and you know all the pitfalls that we ran up against and all the stuff that happened behind the scenes that made the filming difficult was not ever shown in the show because it's playboy tv and it has to be like perfect and everything's like glossy and smooth but like what happened behind the scenes was actually what was the most interesting part of the show so well and it seems like that's a lot of the, the criticism of the adult industry anyways, mm-hmm. right? Is that it doesn't show the reality. It shows yeah. just the perfect angles and the perfect parts edited, you right. know, and we don't see the realistic parts. So that was really enlightening for mm-hmm. me, having been on the show to be like, okay, now I get why people say that. Yeah. Because there's 12 hours of work that went in to get that 30 minute, you know, five yeah. minute in the end, I think edited. Yeah. So <laughs> I know it was a sex scene. It was literally like five minutes. It was fun. It was a lot of fun. And the tape was beautiful. I mean, you, mm-hmm. you all did a really good job of that. So yeah, but behind the scenes, there was so much that went on. I had absolutely no idea about. So tell us, a little, so tell us your experience, like tell, kind of take me through it. Like when you decided to do the show, you know, how, how you felt arriving to set, what it was like, what was unexpected about it. Um, maybe the good and the bad, if, if you want to talk about that. So yeah, tell take it. Let me tell it from your perspective, because they've heard it from my perspective like so many times. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I remember when we applied, we actually thought it was um, Swing. Yes. So Swing was the other show show. that Playboy TV had. And we had a couple of friends because um, my partner at the time and I had been in the swinging lifestyle. And so we had some people kind of in our periphery that had been on that show and we're like oh my gosh that'd be so cool so we applied thinking it was swing and when we got accepted they're like you've been accepted to adult film school and we were like well let's check it out and we're like okay yeah we're doing that (laughs) (laughs) so it was still fun um it just wasn't what quite what we thought but from there um you know that the difference was you make a home sex tape so we're like oh we got that handled because for us we had already kind of been somewhat adept at taking nudes and trying to do sexy you know videos and um I think part of having kind of an active sex uh, life, especially in the swinging community, you're trying to like exchange pictures and things that we thought we were pretty, um, you know, advanced at some of these techniques for a non-professional anyways. 
And so we were super excited and we, you know, put a little ad up on our little swinger website that was like, somebody just want to come take a video for us, you know, and just to watch. And we're like, oh yeah, we had volunteers and we set it up in a way that was like with little lighting and we just had fun with it and then send it in and, um, you know, obviously it was accepted and we got to Austin. We actually flew in a little bit early and spent a few days in Austin, which was a total blast. And then on set, um, I remember you saying, this is the best video we've ever seen. And we were just like flattered by that for like years. Like we made the best sex tape that Holly Randall's <laughs> ever seen, you know? And um, so we were pretty proud. Um, but yeah, the, the, the shoot itself was, was something else because again, we, we didn't know, we didn't have much experience and we, were, we felt pretty like separate most of the day. Mm -hmm. So I was in doing makeup and um, wardrobe and he was kind of waiting in the trailer for me or something and I remember he was like kind of flirting with some other people to try to keep the energy going mm. and I was like you're here with me and this is a thing with me and I want you know your attention and he's like but I got to keep the you know mojo going so that it doesn't you know backfire when the shoot happens and it was so we were kind of there was a little bit of tension there for us um, but I remember getting hair and makeup done I'd never done that like I don't even do my own hair very well and so I was like oh my gosh I'm so beautiful look at this and he was like wow you should do that all the time <laughs> and I remember like wanting to be prettier now after that so I was like learning how to do my hair and learning how to do my makeup and anyways the shoot itself was interesting because um, we did a lot of the stuff that was like commentary after before it even happened so they're like, answer this question as if you had already done the shoot. You know, we're like, oh. And it was like, so how did that go? How do you feel? You know, and we're like, oh, it came out great. That was so, you know, we hadn't even done it yet. <laughs> or like watch the TV scene where we're watching the edited version. And we're like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. You guys did a great job. And we yes. hadn't seen it yet. <laughs> I remember that. Okay, so we did that because obviously we only, you only came you in for one, one day. day and it would take a while to edit it and bring it back. Did we show you some rushes? Did we just show you like raw footage or did we not show I you anything? Think so. I think at that point, because before I think we were trying to show rushes, but I think there was some complicated technical stuff that was coming up. And as you know, the days were already really long. Yep. So at that point we were kind of like, oh, fuck it. <laughs> just look at the screen. Just look at the screen Pretend. and talk about how great we are. And I remember just being like, oh, <gasps> 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 more reaction. <laughs> better nothing on screen <laughs> uh so it was interesting it, logically it makes sense we're yes. there for a day yeah. like we're gonna fly back out to austin two weeks later to look at the screen for 30 seconds so. yeah and logistically and we're like changing clothes for after clothes like have a whole separate outfit for that part for the part that happened after versus the part that was before you know and um and you know we come in at 8 a.m and by the time we get through all those things we didn't even sh start shooting until almost 8 p.m i just remember thinking wow it's been like almost 12 hours um, and so by that point, we're just kind of tired and like, can we go? You yeah. Know? Um, and I'm sure it was a ton of work for you guys and all setting up all the equipment. And so you get through the actual scene and nothing works, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like even as good as you think you can be and how many times you've done on a stage or at a party in front of people or something and the lights and the camera, and it's very medical because you have, again, a camera and lights and people are like, you know, trying to get the right angle of, okay, tilt it this way. And you're like here and you kind of, kind of lose some of the mojo at that point. Mm -hmm. So I remember there was a point where we shifted camera angles so you couldn't see that <laughs> everything. It wasn't, yeah. If you lose, wasn't working, you know, we yeah. did that a lot. We did that. And, and, and yeah. And so the reason that we've talked about this so much, like we, we discussed earlier is that it's a perfect example of, you know, what guys think shooting porn is like and what it's actually like, because I get DMs every day of guys wanting to be in the porn industry, I mean, every single day. And I'm always like, you have no idea, it's not what you think it is. And that in particular, that like the Playboy TV thing in particular, because it was a big production, a lot of money, set design. And I mean, to be honest- And amateurs. Like, and, and amateurs. Um, yeah, no, so that was the prerequisite. Right. It was like the worst combination that you could possibly, <laughs> like all of the things that I would 100% avoid in like my own personal porn shooting experience, like all of the things, like I would have shot the sex before all of the other stuff, because I know that by the time you're tired and you're over it, but for them, 
you know, for this show, it was less about the sex and it was more about the preamble before it, the behind the scenes, the getting prepared for it, the dialogue, the, you know, all that stuff. So like when the sex happened or didn't happen, um, it was kind of like whatever. And, and I've said this so many times, it was like a 90% fail rate for every single couple. It was just like, it's a lot to ask of somebody. And actually, no, you know what? Austin was different because we specifically went to Austin so that we didn't have to abide by the Measure B condom rules because we had to do that when we did, shot the first season in LA. And you can imagine how much more difficult they, that made yep. it because we're asking couples who've been together forever, a lot of them have kids, they haven't used condoms Don't with each them. other in 15 years. And then all of a sudden, not only do you have to have sex on camera for the first time after 12 hours <laughs> in front of like 30 people on like a completely quiet set um, with tons of lights and making you shift camera angles and maybe like an uncomfortable outfit, then you have to put a condom on too with like, you know, right. your, so it was just a disaster. So we purposely moved the whole shootout to Austin because of the condom law, but it was still like, it was still really hard. Well, and I think with such a high, you know, fail rate, yeah. um, you'd become adept at like warning people. Mm -hmm. And I remember specifically getting at least two, if not three emails, like, did you get Cialis? Did you get, you know, Viagra? Did you get a prescription? Um, we, you know, feel like you probably should, if you don't think you need to, you know, and I remember, you know, him saying, I'm good, I'm good. Like I've done, you know, lots of things. And, um, yeah, it, when it didn't, there was definitely some disappointment there. And then there was a little bit of, you know, increased tension with like, you know, well, you weren't, you know, helping much or trying mm -hmm. to get, and I remember trying to be playful and I remember, you know, trying to keep the mood light and like, keep it going, being like fluffer ish, you know, mm -hmm. while we were between cuts or whatever, but it was just, yeah. it's just so much pressure. It's so much pressure. You know? It's so, and, and yeah. <laughs> and I always like, I always felt kind of shitty at the end of the day because I felt like I created this tension between these couples. And I would kind of joke about like how many like relationships did I destroy with this show? I mean, to be fair, like the show was also not my idea. I was just the host. <laughs> well, I wouldn't attribute the failing of that relationship to it, but there was definitely, um, when it came out and they sent us the link, originally the plan was to have a party, have some mm. friends over from the lifestyle. And that didn't happen. He's like, I'm going to watch it before I let anybody see it. Yeah. And it was well, so well done. You couldn't tell, yeah. you couldn't see. And so he was like, okay. Yeah. But it definitely kind of had killed that. Like, you know, let's make this a party yeah. theme. Yeah. There was literally maybe two couples that I recall who like didn't have any issues at all. And we shot 30 couples or something like that. It was, yeah. it was crazy. Yeah. So you, you know, so your, your partner was Only definitely not alone. <laughs> definitely not alone. Um, but yeah, that was, uh, that was quite an experience. So it's really, it's, it's fun to have There's you just on. some idea that that's somehow your masculinity, right? Like your yeah. ability to keep a strong erection throughout all odds uh -huh. is somehow reflective of your identity as a man yeah, or something. And that's kind of unfortunate. Yeah. And so this is a perfect segue to lead into your TED talk. Um, so Nicole Emma did a TED talk. It's fantastic. It's called uh, What Sex Workers Can Teach Us About Human Connection. And um, I watched it and I really loved what you talked about with how, you know, men seek um, human connection through sex. And I think it's interesting to look at some of the fundamental differences between most men and women, of course, I don't want to say all men and women because everybody's different. You know, we got non-binary people out there and all that kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, I think that one could accurately say that, you know, a lot of men find um, strong connections through sex and sometimes it's different for a lot of women. I know for me, like a strong emotional connection, I do not find through sex. I mean, yeah, sex is great, but that's not where I find right. like my connection with my partner. That connection with my partner is like through experience and conversation and you know it other acts other way. of yeah for like, us the more we are connected that way yes and the sex tends to be better yes so really interesting so yeah talk a little bit about um about your your view in that in that subject because i i just thought it was so interesting yeah i think i think as a general um again men are you know by and large conditioned that 
you know, their worth here comes from, um, I think the, the zinger from the Ted talk was muscles, money, and mojo, right? Their, Mm -hmm. um, physical strength, their, their money and financial resources or their, you know, sexual virility. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so they tend to kind of express themselves or be more, um, obvious or forward in one of those areas as a way to try to fit the stereotype of what men ought to be, you know? And so they get over-sexualized sometimes or over-obsessed with money or over, um, gym obsessed or something. Not that that's any of those, having a lot of those things is necessarily unhealthy, but I think a lot of times the why, you know, is a bad driver. Um, and on the same note, they're also not taught that, that it's okay to have emotions, most emotions, right? You can be angry, um, but not cry. Um, and a lot of men's emotional support doesn't come from their platonic friends. You know, guys aren't taught that it's okay to watch a movie and like cuddle on the couch like we can. We can mm-hmm. tickle each other's backs and watch a movie and cuddle or something. And, um, you know, talk to our girlfriends about things and cry and have that support and men don't. So they find their partner and um, then they feel like that's their only so- support of their, you know, emotional health and well-being. And a lot of times the sex is attached to that, that because we will have sex with them and that means they're worthy. Mm-hmm. But if we stop, then all of a sudden either we're denying them something they're due or they're no longer worthy of it. Mm-hmm. And then it becomes this battle. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, you know, so often you see people married, you know, couples who are married for a long time, like the guy wants more sex and like the woman has lost interest. And, and you know, it's just such a common theme is, is this mismatched kind of connection um, sexually with each other. And um, I really loved how, you know, you kind of referred back to these like basic things that we tell boys from when they're a young age, like man up, don't be a sissy, um, take it like a man, that kind of stuff. We really don't encourage vulnerability in men at all. And so there's no outlet for those feelings for a lot of men. And you're right, like, you know, men can't be vulnerable with each other as, as friends, whereas we women are, are often vulnerable with each other as friends. And so it's um, it's a really unfortunate, you know, place that we kind of pigeonhole men in and how we define masculinity. And it's something that we've we've talked about on the show so many times. So in in that idea, you kind of talk about the services that sex workers can provide for men. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Like how are sex workers helpful to men who are having a hard time being vulnerable, um, feeling connected with other people? Well, I think a lot of times we're looking for more than sex. I mean, some obviously there's a lot of people looking for sex. There are. Um, but a lot of times we're looking for somewhere to be vulnerable, someone to, someone that likes us, somewhere to feel important. Um, enjoyed, friendly, you know, there's not a lot of other baggage and other things. And I think by and large, all of us need that regardless of, of gender, um, to have some place where we feel like somebody likes us. And I think unfortunately with, with men not having a lot of other support systems, when they have a, either they're single or they don't have sex in their relationship or they don't have other things or a connection you know, with their partner or something, they don't have anywhere really to be, um, close to somebody. And, and I just, I feel like it's a service, Mm -hmm. you know, it's a way of providing somebody something they need. Mm -hmm. If I, you know, am running a a marathon a week, you know, the week after I'm sore every day, I'm gonna go get a massage. What's the difference? Like, you know, I said, and they're paying somebody to do your taxes or detail your car, you know, and somebody's like, well, we're not cars and we're not, you know, but our needs are, we can go to a counselor. If I'm stressed or overwhelmed, I can go talk it out and get my emotional needs met. Um, you know, sexually what's different? Like, why can't we pay somebody that, for that? Yeah. That's an interesting comparison that you make. Cause, cause it's true. Cause one can say, Oh, well, you know, like you sh- it's this idea that you should only have sex with people if there is some kind of deep connection there, or you're in a committed relationship or there's something like 
beyond just the physicalities of sex. Um, and 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 the th I think another thing that we need to keep in mind is that sex workers are professionals. They're very good at their jobs, right? Like that's why they get hired to do what they do. It's the difference between, you know, maybe having casual sex with a friend or something like that, or, you know, a one night stand um, versus seeing a sex worker. You could compare it to, you know, having a chat with your friend about some, you know, tr problem at, problems that you're going through versus seeing a therapist, somebody who's a professional and knows how to kind of deal with and help you unpack all of these feelings. And I think you could really look at, at sex workers in that way. Like, sure, you don't have to see a sex worker. You could just have casual sex with random people. That's fine. But, you know, sex workers are professional. And a lot of them take uh, real measures to be clean and safe and to use protection. And I think that if you go back and watch a lot of my episodes with uh, full service sex workers, I think that you as a viewer, if you've not watched them, it really help you kind of change your mind about how you see um, full service sex workers. A great example is Alice Little, who works at the Bunny Ranch. And it's so interesting because she talks about the work that she does with virgins. And she talks about how she works with a lot of um, men who are on the spectrum. And Just how, those things up too. yeah, exactly. and, and like the understanding between like how an autistic person might need to be touched differently than like a regular person and how you can enter into that without shame, without judgment and with the knowledge of these like sp specific needs that need to be met and these boundaries that these people need to have and how you can explain this in a very thorough, clear way to somebody before you engage in the act rather than that. I mean, awkward conversation with someone that you just met at a bar. Like, so by the way, this, you know what I mean? Like communication is, is not a great, is usually not like wonderful between, um, you know, casual sex partners, even like long-term sex partners. But if anything I've learned, sex workers are like really great at communication. So yeah, tell us a little bit about um, your experience or your knowledge about working with people with certain, um, you know, issues around sex. Oh yeah. And, and I was going to mention that too, you know, we, there's this lonely man trope thing and those are obviously there, but there's a lot of other things, you know, a lot of other people that, that need service, whether it's just education. I don't, I don't know how this works. I don't know what to do. Um, I have no idea how to, you know, take care of a woman or please a woman or something. And they just want to know so they can be a better lover when they find their partner or something. Um, you know, people that are, disabled or um, have other gaps in, in connecting with people. Um, even somebody just um, like in a wheelchair may have a harder time getting out and dating and finding people and may not have um, physical issues per se, or they may. And it's just like, why can't we just connect in the ways that we find that work for us? Mm -hmm. You know, whatever it is, whatever's yeah. in the way, whether it's, you know, somebody that's too busy and doesn't have time to date. And there's plenty of those um, that aren't somehow, you know, disabled or otherwise. Um, but there's also couples that want to explore and play with things together. There's people that, you know, want to learn and grow, or there's people that want to sit and talk, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you talked about how um, studies show that about five minutes uh, <laughs> is dedicated to sex. And if one is paid for an hour or more, that really opens up the rest of the time slot right. what to else are we doing? what else are you going to do? You're going to talk, right? I, I, that was one of the best um, parts of it to me when I was um, doing sex work was just the, the stories, getting to know people, you know, and they just like want to talk. Oh, I had this, this thing and, you know, we did this big meeting and I finally seen this thing I've been doing for seven years to fruition. And like, they're just cute and adorable with their little things they're proud of. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how'd that go last week? How'd your meeting go? I'm so glad I got to see you so I could talk to you about it because you were so excited. And they're like, you remembered? You know, and something like that is just more phenomenal to them than a blowjob half the time mm -hmm. because I care. Yeah. You know, and so sometimes it's like, hey, I'm just kind of lonely today. Do you want to come watch a movie with me? And sometimes it's like, do you just want to go look at the stars? Mm hmm. You know, and I don't want to do it by myself or, you know, I don't know. There's just so many different. Yeah. And in the end, we're all just trying to connect. Yeah. So many um, sex workers that I've talked to have just have talked about how like 
conversation is like a majority of the session. And, um, yeah, that's that, that, that need to connect. And, um, you, you actually touched on uh, an example that one of my Patreon members gave me, um, who was in a wheelchair. And after I had interviewed a full sex sex worker, you know, wrote to me and said, you know, what your conversation with this woman was so important. And I just want to say like, from my own personal experience, you know, I'm in a wheelchair and as much as, you know, I would like to meet a woman on my own and I would like to date and let's just be realistic women generally don't want to date a guy in a wheelchair. Okay. So like, you know, we as the public have this idea of like, oh, you have to find like your woman on your own through your own merits. Well, some people don't have all of the benefits that the rest of us do. Some people have like some serious physical setbacks, which is really going to prevent them from meeting someone. And let's be honest, like meeting someone is hard enough as it is. So being in a wheelchair, having some other you know, boundary that you come up against is going to make it that much more difficult. And he was just saying, I would not be able to have intimate experiences with women if I didn't have full service sex workers that I could pay to have these experiences with. And he's like, it's so important for me. It's so important for my mental health to know that, you know, I can connect with a woman. I don't mind paying them. And, you know, I don't feel like they only like me because I'm giving them money. Like it, it really helps fulfill a need that I have. And it's so important to me. And thank you for touching on that. And I was like really moved by that because here's, you know, a person, a perfect example of somebody who can't just like go out and meet a woman on his own. You know, I mean, we just, we forget about these people who have, you know, these issues that really prevent them from meeting somebody. Yeah. Yep. It's sad. Yeah. I mean, there's, a whole movement of abolitionists wanting to shut down the industry. And it's like, what does that do though? Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're not looking at what's actually causing this, you know, where's this coming from? There's people that need um, money and jobs and, you know, some, some freedom of their income and, and these things. And there's other people that have a need for a service. Why it, that's the ultimate capitalist ideal, right? Like why can't we match a demand with a, with a supply? And um, I mean, it's going to happen whether it's on Tinder or, you know, a sex work site and yeah. Who are we going to leave in the lurches if everything's shut down? Yeah. I mean, you know? that's the thing. Like it's never going to go away. Right. It's like the oldest profession. You're just going to drive it underground, yeah. um, which is going to make it, you know, I mean, look at Sesta Fosta. Yep. Yeah. Which is just going to yep. make it more dangerous for sex workers. So, right. <sighs> well, I definitely want to get into, um, your co-founding of swap salt lake city but before we do that we're going to take a quick commercial break so hang tight guys awesome. we will be right back got bush you definitely do if you haven't started using the products from my sponsor manscaped since i've started working with manscaped they've really expanded on their product line it's incredible so of course we've got the lawnmower 3.0 their revolutionary electric body trimmer which is not only cordless, but it's also waterproof, so you can actually use it in the shower. They also have the Crop Preserver and the Crop Reviver, a ball deodorant and a ball toner to keep your balls smelling nice and fresh. And if you get their perfect package, you will not only get the aforementioned ball toner and ball deodorant, but you will also get, of course, the electric trimmer, a shed travel bag, and their boxer briefs, which are the most comfortable boxer briefs you will ever wear. You can get all of this for 20% off at manscaped.com by using my code HRU. That's 20% off at manscaped.com by using my code HRU. All right, everybody, we are back. So Nicole, you founded Swap Salt Lake City. Um, can you tell us what the acronym stands for and specifically what um, this outreach program is all about? Yeah. Um, SWAP is Sex Work Outreach Project, which is a national uh, nonprofit uh, dedicated to, um, you know, assisting and, and supporting sex workers um, and also fighting for the rights and equal treatment of, of sex workers, um, whether they're in the business consensually or not. Um, and we, my uh, business partner and I had found a local organization in Salt Lake that was organizing the march after the inauguration um, when Trump took office and the women's march. And so we both just, we didn't know each other yet and found our way to this org and 
were discussing, you know, as that group grow, grew so quickly right off the bat, they were kind of organizing different things. What, what can people contribute? What can you be a part in? And we both kind of found our way into like, well, we want to talk about, you know, the rights of sex workers and um, body autonomy, equal access to the economy and all these really feminist principles. And they're like, we can't do that. And we're like, you know, this is ultimately the, the feminist like ideal. Right. Right. The equal access to, to money and, and be self-sustaining and make our own decisions about our lives and just all these things. And they're like, yeah, but people won't donate. You know, and it was like, <laughs> oh, well, we'll do it ourselves then, <laughs> you know? And she and I branched off and um, formed a local uh, group um, with as much, you know, anonymity and privacy as we could and tried to get a support system underway for people that just needed. And this was about the time that FOSTA um, was coming in. I think that was a year later technically when it came in but they'd already raided back page um before the, you know the laws were even in effect but so we were like we need a support system we need to be able to talk to each other and help help each other th you know through a lot of this stuff and so we started a local private group and then as we were kind of looking around we realized there was already kind of a national org doing this that we would like to be a part of um so we don't have to you know rewrite the whole mm -hmm. agenda kind of a thing um, so we applied to become uh, a chapter of Swap National, and for the first several years, you know, we spent hours at the Capitol every session talking through different pieces of legislation. Um, I worked on a bill with one of our legislators that protects um, sex workers reporting crimes from being charged with prostitution, mm -hmm. um, like a, you know, an immunity thing because people wouldn't be able to come forward, and like this is absurd. So we got that legislation through, which was helpful. Um, we were starting another one that kind of went by the wayside with COVID, but ho hopefully getting that back in place about um, police officers not being allowed to have sex with people in their custody. Another no-brainer, but that's not a law in Utah. Really? Yeah, there's only like 13 states, I think, that have that as a law, which is absurd. And so what would happen is a lot of times they'd be like, well, if you don't you know, sleep with me, I'll arrest you. Wow. I'll take you in, I'll book you. So it's like, well, do you want a record and a fine? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And there were some situations, um, like one back east where a woman was in that in that position. And I don't know, the story wasn't there, but it sounds like from the media accounts that, you know, there was some um, fight or something that broke loose and she was shot and killed in the cop's car, you know, in his custody having sex. And it was like, this, this can't happen. So we're just trying to work those things. Um, my partner who's now moved um, just a few months ago to state, and I miss her dearly, but she started a really awesome outreach program um, in Salt Lake, and we would visit people that are on the streets or in these really horrible pay-by-the-day motels and just take them clothes and food and condoms and, you know, whatever, because they're just trying to survive. They're just doing what they can. Mm -hmm. um, trying to get to know people, trying to put faces to names and stuff. Hey, so-and-so, how are you? You mm -hmm. okay? You know, what, what do you need? What can I get you? Mm -hmm. um, trying to get them services, anything that would be helpful, whether it was, you know, mental health or, um, you know, shelters or anything we could. And uh, through COVID, a lot of the nonprofits stopped doing a lot of outreach or downsized greatly because, you know, they were put at risk. Um, a lot of people were home. And we just kind of found that there was an unserved market there. Mm -hmm. And so we started going out, you know, twice a week, taking out food and supplies and whatever we could pull together. So. Wow. We've kind of made something of SWAP <laughs> in Salt Lake City, of all places, um, over the last four years, and that's been really cool. Where can people, if people want to help support the organization, where can they go to donate, or wh what are things that people can do to help you with this? Yeah, thanks. Um, you can find us, I think we're mostly on Facebook as an org, um, which is SWAP Salt Lake City, mm -hmm. S-W-O-P. And um, SWAP USA has a website, swapusa.org. Um, I haven't taken the time to build out, build out our specific page, Salt Lake City page yet, but all the information of what we're about is on the uh, national website there. But overall, I think the best thing that people can do to support it is really pay attention to who they're voting for, look closely at organizations that say they help people in the industry or, or trafficking survivors, because um, not all of them are legit. There's some mm -hmm. very prominent ones that aren't. Um, and, and people that are fighting you know, to, to shut these websites down and completely, you know, destroy the, the, the business are hurting more than they're helping. Yeah. You these, I, I, 
I can think of some very specific organizations um, that, you know, really model themselves under this whole umbrella of we're helping sex trafficking victims get out of, you know, this incredibly um, violent seedy underworld that they work in, but essentially they're taking away these people's resources and income and um, capabilities and, you know, very much just anti-porn, anti-sex work. Um, I had Elizabeth Nolan Brown on and we talked about, um, there was a really famous case um, with the massage parlor bust, an Asian massage parlor bust. Of course, I'm forgetting the name of um, the, was it Kraft mm -hmm. that was involved? Yeah, Robert and then yeah. Robert Kraft. And then, um, you know, these women that they rescued from this Asian massage parlor were all charged and thrown in jail. And then the charges were dropped later because they didn't have any right. evidence to right. show that it was, yeah. But it's like, how are you saving sex workers if you're but like- It's the one thing where we arrest the victims. Yeah. How are we doing that? Yeah. You know, like, oh, you're, you're a victim, we're gonna put you in jail. Right. That's not how crime works. <laughs> we can't stop it. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, it's pretty frustrating. Do you see like overall, I mean, you know, I've been in the adult industry for over 20 years. I definitely have seen positive changes in terms of like porn stars, um, you know, uh, per independence, financial independence, personal independence, you know, the um, these content platforms that have come along, OnlyFans, et cetera, have really put power in the in the hands of, um, of porn stars. And I, I see that um, the balance of power has shifted more towards the performers and and they seem to be doing, you know, much better and, and really standing up for themselves and and really um, having more advocacy over their career. Do you see do you see any like improvement in like the lives and the and possibly the future of sex workers? Do you think that we're headed in the right direction? Do you think not so much? I, mean, I think both probably. Um, I, you know, was in the industry early on too, to probably 2000. Um, I started escorting back then, but so I've seen a lot of changes over the years too. And I think it's, it's polarized. You know, there's a lot of progress. Like you said, there's a lot more access, um, economically for people. There's a lot more acceptance as it's becoming something that's a talking point and people are more accustomed to hearing the words and, and understanding the industry and whatnot, but I think there's also a polarized opposite of people that are like, oh, we didn't see this before, and now that it's more visible, we need to be more actively shutting it down. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that kind of polarization is probably true with anything. Um, I mean, even technology, I think we it grew faster than our tools did mm -hmm. as a society. Um, and I think a lot of this is like that, you know, media and, and sex, and I mean, there's a lot of, you know, polarization around decriminalizing cannabis, mm -hmm. you know, any of these things that we, we have a lot of progress, but we're going to have some people that are really noisy about not progressing. Right. Are you and hopeful? I didn't see a lot of that before. I didn't see, I don't remember really seeing like these big active pushes to like shut everything down. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So I just think because it was a little lower on the radar, people didn't invest so hard in either direction. Yeah. It's interesting because, you know, my parents having been in the industry 20 or 30 years, 20 years before I was born, um, you know, you see, it's very cyclical. You see this come back, this, you know, it got me thinking about the Mies Commission back in 1985, where, you know, they were basically trying to make porn illegal. Um, right. The the case of, um, oh my gosh, Freeman, Hal Freeman, uh, the, the Freeman case, which essentially ended up, when all the way to the Supreme Court, ended up making um, porn legal in California. California is one of the only states that actually had, like, a legal battle about what porn was, and, and they won and made porn legal. And, and the only reason that porn was made legal was because originally um, uh, the Mies Commission and, and other anti-porn people were trying to say that porn was essentially prostitution, that it was pimping and pandering. And um, with the Freeman case, we were able to prove that you know, porn is, is not prostitution. It's a um, form of entertainment that involves two people. So for, I've had people ask me this question before, what's the difference between prostitution and porn? Like, here's the kind of basic fundamental difference. Prostitution is when um, 
a one a customer is paying a sex worker directly for a service directly to them, right? And then porn is when a outside entity like a production company is paying two professional performers to engage in creating a product that is then distributed in mass to the public. So that's like the essential difference between porn and prostitution. But, you know, of course, the only reason that porn was made legal in California was because it wasn't prostitution. You know, so there's still like this whole anti-sex well, work sure angle to it. the production industry behind that. Yeah. Legally yeah. and financially. You know? Oh, of course. Um, and it's interesting, too, to see the huge change in viewing sex work now, actually, because also 10, 15 years ago, if you were a porn star, um, you never talked about doing full service sex work. That was a big no-no. That was considered like beneath you, like you were a porn star, you were a performer, you were a star. You would never, ever like be a prostitute. Right. Right. And girls would cancel scenes with other girls if they heard that they escorted on the side. I mean, they would refuse to work with them. So there was a huge stigma in the porn industry against other sex workers right. but and of course the word sex work didn't exist right, right? because sex work has, has now come forward as this kind of all-encompassing term which i think has helped united everybody who works in the sex industry and yeah it's changed dramatically now people are much more open to talking about escorting and doing full service sex work and trying not to be biased against it but of course you know we still see that but it's just interesting to watch how everything's changed so much i think there's much. still a little bit of hierarchy within oh 100 but yeah but not people it's nothing like what it was though yeah absolutely yeah so um i want to talk about one other um subject uh you are a survivor of domestic abuse yeah. which is you know um a pretty heavy subject that we've actually i don't think we've ever really explored it on this podcast um so i really appreciate you being mm -hmm. willing to be open about it because i know there's a lot of people who deal with this and I've never experienced it myself, so I, I cannot come from a place of experience and I cannot, I think, offer any kind of advice or insight on the subject. So can you tell us a little bit about your experience and how you got out of it? Yeah. Um, there's not a, a big jump uh, in terms of psychology between trafficking and domestic abuse. A lot of the techniques are the same. A lot of the... Um, tools isn't the right word I want there but you know the the intermittent reinforcement is one of the the main tools to try to uh, intellectually like manipulate somebody right you treat them well and give them everything I want and they're the your, your person one day and the next one they can't do anything right and they're horrible and how could you ever and you go back and forth and it, it's like a dog when you only give them a treat once in a while mm -hmm. they'll try anything they can to do the right thing for you all the time to get that treat mm -hmm. um and and you know people who are are coercing um people into the, into the sex industry or in relationships, it's the very same dynamic. So you get a lot of psychological conditioning and a lot of push pull and you find yourself in this, I can't please you enough, what could I do? And um, you know, I'd mentioned a little like on set of adult film school that I was scolded a bit for not doing the right things for him to keep his um, performance um, right. So there's a lot of that and I'm like, oh, what can I do better? What can I, you know? Um, and you just kind of end up in this pattern and it, a lot of um, where I started finally making the, the connections and leaving came from Ted. Mm -hmm. um, the process that that took me through to be the person I wanted to be on that stage, to be able to talk about this confidently and to not be terrified. And, you know, I did a lot of internal work and in that process, I stopped investing all my energy into my relationship and he had noticed that gap and tried a lot of things to pull me back. And that's when I was like, wait, I'm not doing anything wrong here. This is something that's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Like you really should be supporting the person that you love and not dragging them down. Mm -hmm. And so kind of seeing that and seeing the things that were being said, you know, you don't deserve this. You don't, um, you're not any different to me than, you know, the men you're talking about. And you're gonna go out and tell this big story about how you saved the world when you're doing the same thing to me. And, and I was just like, who does that? Who says that to the person they love? Like who says, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so that process was like, wait a second, there's something not right here. There's something not right. And um, it was actually through some things like sex work and the TED and a couple other just pointed experiences in there that I was able to get out 
because with sex work, I was able to sustain myself financially. I wasn't dependent on him for a place to live. I've got kids. Um, we have one together. And so it was this battle of like, well, if I can't support myself, I either end up back there or he takes my kids, mm -hmm. you know? And so being really like committed to being on my own feet and not leaving, um, you know, that was a way out. Yeah. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so contrary to what, you know, many might think, cause you know, we talked about how a lot of people believe that domestic abuse goes hand in hand with sex work, right? You only get into sex work if you're a victim of domestic abuse or like they're, they're always like one and the same, but you're kind of talking about how sex work got you out of a domestic abuse mm -hmm. situation. So that's, um, right. that's against like the narrative that so many of us hear. Yeah. And I think there's, there's an element there that, that, you know, we're, we're putting the chicken before the egg with that sometimes people that have had some traumas have, have a harder time with other jobs and other industries, you mm -hmm. know, having PTSD or having, you know, some people have some pretty severe physical traumas. Um, you know, you've been out of the workforce for a while because generally they, they sabotage you financially, um, sab sabotage your, your work and these types of things. The goal is to make you dependent and make you kind of stuck that way. And so trying to reassimilate into the workforce is difficult. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for people that may have some, some pretty severe, you know, depression and anxiety and these things that are normal for PTSD, um, having an eight to five job is really difficult. And, you know, let alone anybody that has any other kind of marginalization you know, the people that aren't quite as passable in the normal workforce or they don't have education or they don't have, um, you know, experience or these other things. Like sex work is a way to create your own empowerment around your income. Mm -hmm. You create your hours, you choose which, you know, whether it's online or mm -hmm. full service or pictures, who you're going to talk to, who you're going to engage with, how much you're going to charge, what hours you're going to work. Um, if something comes up and you have to cancel something, there's a little bit more room there where losing one client versus losing your whole entire job, you yeah. know, um, and having some quick money mm -hmm. to get under you and get some resources and, you know, pay, pay for your rent or something. Right. Um, that I don't think people really account for that haven't ever dealt with that. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, Nicole, thank you so much. Yeah. This has been uh, a really amazing interesting interview and i'm so happy that you came on <laughs> so and many weird stories to tell i know like, i know I right from this to this i know we really like covered like covered everything i feel like yeah. it's a lot of interesting topics <laughs> um can you tell everybody where they can find you online your socials website whatever you want to plug yeah um it's nicole emma uh the, or the sassy sex coach i think it's just nicole emma.com um, Facebook and Insta is all Nicole Emma. I try to keep that simple. So perfect. Uh, hello at Nicole Emma.com. <laughs> it's my email. <laughs> <laughs> um, make sure that you guys check out her Ted talk. Um, if you just, uh, Google Nicole Emma, um, TEDx. what's yeah. Pulls TEDx right actually it will. Yeah. That's how I found you. Yep. Yeah. It's a, it's a really, really great talk. So congratulations on that. Um, and you guys can find me on Instagram and on Twitter at Holly Randall, um, support this podcast, of course, at patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. And thank you so much for joining us and I'll see you next week. Thank you. Since I've started working with Manscaped, they've really expanded on their product line. It's incredible. And if you get their perfect package, you will not only get ball toner, and ball deodorant, but you will also get, of course, the electric trimmer, a shed travel bag, and their boxer briefs, which are the most comfortable boxer briefs. You can get all of this for 20% off at manscaped.com by using my code HRU.